I've uh, put in bold master. I'd like you to think about that word for a moment. Which master are we going to serve? This book, which I brought a copy of for you to see, is the, uh, is the Bible. This is Chaos and Organization in Healthcare. It's written by Thomas H. Lee and the late James J. J. Mongan. Many of you, most of you here in this room know, know those people. And I admire them a great deal, and, and I consider Tom Lee one of my closest friends uh, in medicine. It's a, it's a very, very well-written, extremely cleverly written book with a lot of the policy wonk brilliance of Mongan and the humor and softness of Thomas H. Lee so that when it goes down, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't taste so bitter. Um, and, and, and I want you to remember the gospel of this Bible because I think it's stated as about as clearly as can be. Let me summarize it, summarize it for you. Those of you who hadn't read it, I would highly recommend that you read it. Uh, society has endured, uh, has endured an, academic, uh, an economic downturn. That's right, isn't it? A bad, a bad recession, almost a depression. People talk about a double dip recession. Healthcare consumes too much of a shrinking pie. It's interesting that Jim used the word pie. <laughs> and I'm, I'm gonna come back in the question and answer question about, about the giving the child all the pie. Because that's not the point at all. That's the wrong point. Because the good parent, of course, does not give the, the child the, uh, all the pie. Um, and, and it pushes out things like the K through eight education that we heard about, but also police and the military. And it says education, but we're, we aren't the only important functions of society. We've heard that just said. And new technologies are the problem, aren't they? They keep coming so fast. There's CT and there's PET CT and there's functional MRI. No end to it. The rising cost of health care is unsustainable. That is the gospel. Isn't that right, what you're told? What we're told? It is unsustainable. And furthermore, we have a, a, a relatively weak health care system that by most numbers, other Western countries are better than we are, spending less money than we are. That's the gospel. Chaos is the problem, and organization is the solution. That's the, that's the byword. That's it, isn't it? So, th so there's, the, there's the gospel. What principles would one derive if you believed in this, in this Bible? You would derive the, the, the theory that doctors are the experts who need to help society decide what it can afford. After all, doctors know about medicine and sickness. Who else should society ask? You would conclude that public health measures, and we just heard that again from Jim's mouth, public health measures are much more cost effective than individual care. We can help a lot more people with public health than we can with individual care. And there's, and there's a long history of that. Washing hands, giving antibiotics, uh, sterile deliveries, and so on. Advances in genetics can help us predict disease liability, personalized medicine. Have you heard that? We have personalized medicine. Fastidious medical records are going to impure, improve care. That goes without saying, right? <laughs> and system innovations can prevent errors. My, my colleague, Dr. Atul Gawande, make a list like a, like a pilot, and errors will be pre prevented. So these principles have been derived. And if you were living in a society that had just undergone a terrible economic downturn and believed in these principles, what would be the solution? I ask you now to imagine where the society was and when this occurred. Uh, you should start with public health. Promote uh, healthy lifestyles. Smoking is very dangerous. One should avoid high-risk sexual behaviors because there are sexually transmitted diseases. One should exercise and maintain health. Making people believe 
that this somehow allows people to live forever. Even though we all know that the death rate, when this happened, and now, is one per person. <laughs> and then you might ask doctors to begin to identify individuals who are likely to consume more than their share of the care. Have you heard this? How about the last of the year of life? How about cognitive delay? How about dementia and the threat of the baby boomers growing older? We can identify that, those groups and give them special kinds of care with special kinds of people, right, which is going to reduce the cost and improve, improve the quality of their care because we've identified them as very risky types of people, now, the mentally retarded, the demented, the old, and the very sick. Are you beginning to have a sense what society might have thought, thought of these same issues? And then put in some systems, systems that you demand everybody follow. Hand washing, fastidious modern medical records. The word modern, by the way, has always been used. <laughs> we are always at the cutting edge. And so was, so was von Leeuwenhoek when he looked down his microscope. He was also on the cutting edge. Don't think we're more on the cutting edge. We are not more on the cutting edge. We're on the same old cutting edge <laughs> that people have always been. We should have checklists and routines and regimentation. And it says in the Bible that a closed system, a closed system is more efficient at doing this than an open system. What do we mean by a closed system? In the modern era, that would mean Geisinger Healthcare, the Veterans Administration, and you can name a number of them, right? Where the doctors are totally employed and they are told you will do the following and if you do not, you are fired, period. Very simple. That was like in the days of Charcot. He didn't have MRIs. That's what he, if he said something was a tumor, it was a tumor. If you said something else, you were fired. <laughs> he had a very simple system. That's why he was right all the time. <laughs> And you teach, you teach these, principles of the solu these principles and this solution, and, and you teach them in medical school. Teach them in courses. So that a generation, and then a second generation, and a third generation of doctors believe completely in this Bible. In fact, they cannot remember a time when there wasn't this Bible. And now you tell the doctors, Let's, why don't you help us by reporting the birth of every cognitively and physically disabled infant so we can keep a record of these people who consu consume too much health care. After all, we've had a bad economic downturn. We can't afford to do everything. Because if we put this, all the money into these people, how are we going to maintain the military against all the risks out there? And the education system. Have you heard this before? Doctors are supposed to use their influence and their knowledge of modern science, modern, again, science, to instruct society about the use of cost-effective care. How, how will they know? We should know. We doctors, shouldn't we? Doctors ultimately will become the agents of society. They will promulgate group priorities over individual priorities. And I'm reminded to tell you about the invaders from Mars. How many of you have seen the movie the Invaders from Mars, 1954. Those of you who haven't, uh, rent it. <laughs> it's the scariest movie I think ever, ever done. It, better than Rosemary's Baby, scary movie. Uh, it was at a time when we were all afraid of the Russians. The Russians were evil. And this thing represented the Russians. Creatures came from outer space. You didn't see them. They landed on Earth and they captured people one at a time, sucked them underground and took them to an operating room where they took out their brains with neurosurgery, modern <laughs> neurosurgery. <laughs> and they replaced their brains with a computer connected to a central computer by these evil automatons. And then they put these people back into society where they looked 
just like the people they once were. <laughs> but they weren't. Uh, they were evil automatons. And slowly over the course of the movie, everyone becomes one of them. And no one can believe that anyone around them any longer can be trusted, including your brother and your sister and your mother. And the only way you can tell that one of them is in your presence is to sneak around behind them and look at the nape of their neck where you can see two little holes where the neurosurgical procedure was done. Should we look at the back of each other's neck? <laughs> It's the invaders from Mars. These are people who have ceased being people. They are carrying out the actions of a foreign force, even though they look like people. We now have doctors exactly like that. Doctors who have ceased being doctors. They look like doctors. They wear white coats. They have name tags. But if you look at the nape of their neck, <laughs> you can see that they're not speaking as doctors anymore. They have been invaded by these evil automatons. And then there's the final solution. I don't know how many of you had a chance to see this uh, exhibit when it was in Boston at the uh, Conway Library. Uh, everything that I have quoted in the last three slides is taken directly, directly, from the period of time before the Nazis took power in Germany. Uh, the 25 year period before that was the period in which the invention of genetics, distorted as eugenics, was promulgated as a new science. It was said that the, uh, the society uh, was, in a, was in a terrible economic decline, that it could not afford everything, that it had to make decisions, and that it had to decide who was at the greatest risk. It was there that the danger of tobacco smoking was discovered, not here. It was there that the danger of uh, unbridled sexual activity would be dangerous and cause syphilis, now AIDS. Not here. They argued that it was the doctor's responsibility to promulgate public health, and that, and that it, or, if he did not do that, the society would collapse in its own way because it wouldn't have enough money for the military. It wouldn't have enough money for the schools. It would waste everything on medicine. And that's how the doctors were co-opted. And by the way, without these doctors, they could have never carried out the final solution. These doctors were critical to the deciding of who was and who was not capable of working versus dying. They made the decisions. So how do we avoid this? And I'm going to present you my second case, which is a case from last week. My view is, is, is a very clear one. It has nothing to do with cost effectiveness. Simultaneously considering the interests of society and the individual patient is an irresolvable conflict of interest. An adversarial system like our legal system is the only system that protects us against this. Let me put it simply. The same lawyer cannot represent the state and the individual in a trial. As we're learning uh, again in Egypt, again, about, uh, about this idea. And in Pakistan. Uh, before I present my second case, some disclaimers. Things I want to make sure you understand that I did not say. I did not say that public health is evil. There's m very, very good evidence that more lives are saved by public health than by individual health care. I simply said that public health was used as a way of co-opting doctors into an e by the evil empire, the, the, the invaders from Mars. The best care is cost effective. It's bad care that's not cost effective. Overutilization is not what I asked for. In fact, it is not only expensive, it is dangerous. What about the incidental OMA, right? Getting an MRI when an MRI is not indicated, that isn't just money. That's risk. What if we find a meningioma? 
What if we find hydrocephalus? What then? You've seen your patients with little white spots, turned into MS patients, normal people, turned into MS patients by, by a test. That's not good medicine. That's not what I'm telling you we should be doing. Errors are not desirable, but they are absolutely unavoidable. Errors are made every day. We all make errors. And without errors, we would have no progress. Think about evolution. What would happen to our organism if it had no chance of mutating? The environment changes, no chance of mutating. Let me put it simply. If that were the case, I would be practicing neurology exactly the way my teachers practiced neurology because I tried to imitate them. That was Ray Adams. He was my teacher. I would be doing what he was doing. And if, and if he did it, well, he would be doing exactly what his teacher was doing, who would be doing what his teacher is doing and his teacher is doing, all the way back to John Hewlings Jackson. And although it is true that John Hewlings Jackson is 100 times the neurologist that I will ever be, John Hewlings Jackson can't practice neurology in 2012. He never heard of AIDS. He couldn't possibly work now. Now, the only reason that I can adapt to the current environment is the series of errors that all of us have made over that time. That, those are the mutations that allowed us to adapt to the new circumstance. So, so errors are, are, we are meant, we are trying to avoid errors. We want to avoid errors. We cannot avoid errors. And if we could, we'd be in deep, deep trouble. We would never change. Final case from a week ago. A 60-year-old woman complains of a new type of headache that's been worsening over the past two months. It comes in attacks lasting 20 minutes. The headache is really a non-pulsatile eye pain, not a head pain, an eye pain, non-pulsatile, without any autonomic features. The eye didn't turn red, she doesn't get Horner syndrome, her nostril doesn't stuff up. She has no prior history of migraine. The patient herself is a doctor. She is sent to me by her husband, who is also a doctor. The headaches are interfering with her work as a doctor. Her general and neurological examination are completely normal. A primary care doctor has already seen her several times, ordered many blood tests, and tried various analgesics, none of which have had any benefit whatsoever, and her SED rate is 5. What is it? Eye exam was normal. When I said the physical exam was normal, I mean eye exam, physical, what is it? Who here knows what this is? I know that at least one person to my right knows what it is, but he's not going to say. What is the diagnosis? You're the doctor. We're in here one-on-one -on -one with this patient. This isn't society as a whole. This is a doctor talking to another doctor. What is the answer? This is called episodic paroxysmal hemicrania. It's a primary headache syndrome. Look it up in the International Headache Society. It, uh, I, it's recognizable by its characteristics as much as you could know a giraffe when you see one coming down the street. <laughs> and if you say it's rare, it actually isn't rare, but that doesn't matter, does it? Because if a giraffe came down the street, no matter how rare, you would know it. <laughs> and, and, and it's not statistical, right? It is what it is. So I said to her, you've got episodic paroxysmal hemicrania. She said, I've never heard of it. I showed it to her on the internet. I said, here it is. This is a primary headache syndrome. It's also known as indomethacin responsive headache. You will be completely cured by indomethacin. No other drug will work. Uh, why this is true is an interesting question, but beyond the scope of our discussion. <laughs> Indomethacin, indomethacin crosses a blood-brain barrier. It may do other things. In any case, it's the only drug that works. The patient said she believed me, looked me right in the eye. I had done, a, I, I had a one hour interaction with her. I examined her. But she said, you know, doctors make mistakes. I really would like a brain image just to get this out of the back of my mind. What would you do? Not in general, not in general, not statistically. Not in society. Now, what are you going to do? So you're all mumbling different things. I don't know what you would do. What you would tell you? I'm not giving you a, an MRI so she can go to an emergency department and get one. My hypothesis was 
if this patient had simple hemicrania, but she harbored an unstated fear that the headache represented a serious symptom of an underlying disease, probably a brain tumor. This fear was enhanced by her knowledge of medicine and the growing concern in the environment around us because of this and the rest of these Bibles that doctors are making so many errors that they're killing more people than disease is killing. The most outrageous idea I have ever heard. <laughs> my, my reassurance was not fully helpful. And how did I know it? She had the Freddy sign. <laughs> That's my dog. That's my dog, Freddy. And uh, when he doesn't believe you, doesn't understand you, wonders what you said, he tilts his head. And I look for that sign, and when I see it, I get an MRI. <laughs> because I know that I cannot make this headache go away until I get out of the back of her mind that fear that this thing represents an underlying disease. And so we got an MRI. I called, them, I called them up. There was a cancellation that afternoon. She walked down there. It was done. They called me back 15 minutes later. I told her. And now I'm going to read you, because it's small, I'm going to read you the email exchange. You can see the date, November 21st. This just happened. This is me to her. I heard you're feeling better. I'm delighted to hear that. Find the minimum dose that works and use it for a couple of weeks, and then try to slowly taper it if the symptoms aren't, are, are completely gone. This tends to go into remission and may not need meds for some time. Have a great tea day. Response from her. Yes, almost cured. Thanks so much for your reassurance and expertise. Indomethacin was like magic. We'll do as you suggest and we'll let you know if, there's any, if I have any more problems. My, my response. That's great news. It's wonderful how predictable hemicrania is. <laughs> Slowly taper over a week or two will probably lead to a prolonged remission, but keep some indomethacin in the medicine cabinet. Her response, thanks again. It's a lot easier working without a constant headache. How would you like to be under the knife, uh, uh, her, her knife, when she was uh, worried that she had a brain tumor and had a constant eye pain? So I finished with these questions. Was that MRI cost effective, yes or no? Yes. By far, yes. Huh? Yes. Trying not to do that MRI would have cost us so much more in wasted time, and ultimately she would get it anyway, wouldn't she? Was that MRI in the interest of society? Yes, yes it was interest of society. What about the, all the patients who had to see her? What were the risks and benefits of that MRI? Well, the benefit we saw. She thinks the endomethacin cured her. The endomethacin cured her, but only because the MRI was negative. Those two things cured her. And now she's cured. Uh, uh, what, were, what were the risks? Well, we could have found hydrocephalus. What if we found a Chiari malformation? We could have found something. We were taking a risk, but it was a calculated risk, a risk that we knew about in advance. There would be a small risk that we would find something that we didn't want to see. Could guidelines have helped this patient? What guidelines? Look them up. See if you can find anything in anybody's guidelines or anybody's checklist that would help you with this problem. Do you think a, uh, a closed system like Geisinger or, or the VA or, or Virginia Mason would have been better? Should she have gotten in a plane and flown to, Phila flown to uh, Pennsylvania and gone to Geisinger for this? Could a physician extender have handled this problem? Would an internet search have helped or hurt? It would have added to her concern, of course, because in actual fact, it can be a secondary headache. And one of these that I had, identical in all respects and responsive to Indocin, turned out to be Wegner's granulomatosis. So she was right. Uh, it could be a secondary headache. And so I conclude. Physicians are required to do everything that they believe may benefit each patient, not everything that the patient wants, like every piece of pie. Everything that they believe may benefit the patient without regard to cost 
or other societal considerations, Norman G. Lubinsky. Thank you.